Willkommen in einem anderen aufregenden Video or welcome to another exciting video. This video is an overview and example of play for what I call a Napoleon at War version 1 figure gaming rules. Napoleon at War is a series of board games published by SPI back in the 1970s. This video uses a figure game version of these rules and their scenarios. Now this is not really going to be a rules focused video, instead it's going to provide an overview of what a game using this kind of rules concept would look and feel like. Napoleon at War is a game system which uses scales of 400 meters per hex and with a unit which represents about a thousand men per strength point. There is some variability in the scale, but this is the basic scale format I'll be using for the figure game conversion. Each game turn generally represents two hours of real time, although in some of the battles, such as Moringo, this represents only one hour of real time. If players wish to try this, they could simply obtain a copy of the original SPR rules and do the conversion themselves. But if you wish to use my attempt, it can be found in the Kriegspiel IO group site. Just look for the Files icon, select the Napoleonic Rules folder and Napoleon at Wars folder. This overview and example again video will be using the Marengo scenario. I've converted about 10 of the board games into figure gaming scenarios for those who are interested. A quick warning, the scenarios are a direct copy from the board game and I've not extensively tested all of them. Because of the different size of the battles, I use a different scaling ratio based on the size of the battle. So for Marengo, for example, two strength points equals one element with an allowed stacking of either three or four. In this video, I'm gonna use four. Stacking simply means the number of elements which can be part of a single unit for combat purposes only. Now for the major difference between the SPR rules and the figure gaming rules, this rules conversion does not use hexes. I feel that if you're gonna use hexes, you're better off playing the board game. Now, in order to accommodate the lack of hexes, I had to add a movement and combat a zones of control to represent the hexes and their zones of controls. Otherwise, it works in the same manner as the old rules, and for those who played the old rules, they would find many aspects very familiar. The CRT has some loss, step loss casualties added to it as well. As units now represent more than one step, it's simple to add this and reduce the reliance on surrounding units to eliminate them, which I must admit is not particularly accurate, even if it did work. Players can opt to use the original CRT if they wish. The playing area is based on the original Marengo board gaming map, which you can see here. The Austrians come in from the left edge and the French are basically initially deployed around Marengo and scattered all over the place. In order to assist me in converting a board game map into a figure gaming area, I had to create this terrain template. This is based on the Marengo board game map. The roads are only used to negate existing terrain, so don't actually need to be placed on the playing area if you don't wish to. And actually in the special custom pieces of terrain, I have them there, but in the default terrain area or the terrain playing area that I normally have, the roads actually don't match anything. So as a general rule of thumb, except where they cross bridges and where they go through a bad terrain, they can be pretty much ignored. Now we come to the actual figure gaming playing area. This shows the playing area. This also shows the largest issues with creating historical battles, creating the terrain. I had to create a custom piece of terrain to, pl to place in my standard three by four foot terrain tray the roads do not line up, which is annoying, but from a game system point of view, it's not an issue. To do this properly, I would need to create the entire 3 by foot, 4 foot terrain with the Marengo tape terrain features built onto it. The built-in terrain is mainly water features such as streams and, road, uh, streams and rivers, and of course roads. Woods, hills and built up areas can be placed on the playing areas, detachable and flexible terrain pieces. These are certainly not the issue. The issue is basically the water features. I need to rethink how I do my water features and roads in future because it's simply not practical for me to create 10 custom made terrain playing areas of this side. 
much less if I decide to go for a, a double size playing area which is basically six by eight foot. There's no way I'm going to do that in a custom made arrangement. Incidentally six by eight is an option if you want to play this using different scaling where each unit is two elements wide. Um, I'm not going to be playing this but I do know some of my comrades prefer the really big playing area and this system can actually accommodate that if you so desire. I tend to prefer this size. Apart from the large hill, uh, which is on the original Marengo playing area, the main terrain piece I had to create was this water feature, the rivers and the streams, which also allowed me to insert the roads and bridges in as well. This fits on top of my standard terrain feature, and even though it looks like there's a hill around the edges, it's assumed that uh, the edge of this, which is the rounded edge, does not represent a crest or hill or anything, it just simply happens to be the way it is if I'm going to be placing a 3mm MDF special terrain piece on top of an existing piece of terrain. It looks okay, which is good, it's just a lot of effort to create. This shows the deployment, actually it's from my scenario deployment sheet showing you where you place all your elements. The deployment position, I think from memory, is about 7am with the Austrians only beginning their crossing of the major river and the French scattered all over the place. The French in this case were totally surprised, This is, uh, which is what occurred historically. The Austrian total force consists of 44 elements, not including commanders. The French player starts with 20 elements and gets 18 elements reinforcements, while the Austrians outnumber the French by 4 elements in total. The French do get a special attack bonus at the end of the game, which gives them a massive punch. It is a fudge, but it does work. I suspect if the rules contained more detailed command control and command equality rules, this would not be needed. You've seen this uh, previously. This is basically the setup. This shows you the force mixes, mainly the Austrians and also some of the French, viewing from the Austrian side. You'll see in the bottom left Alexandria, which is the Austrian staging point. You can also see that one element is just over the bridge or over the river. And then you can see as you move further up the screen, the French initial position around Marengo and then far to the rear, up at the top, it's one of the, the next core, I think it's Lanz core. This shows the a position at the S end of the Austrian movement phase. The Austrian player is the first player. I made an error with the French deployment. The Austrians took Marengo just. However, during the Austrian combat phase, they were forced to attack. And during the combat, forced to retreat out of Marengo, allowing the French to reoccupy it. Movement is calculated in base widths, which in this case is 4 centimetres. So, you know, basically the rules are designed around the element width. So if you happen to have 6 centimetre widths or 3 centimetre widths, that happens to be the base width, then you can adjust everything accordingly. Now, the Austrian foot have a movement allowance of 3 movement points, so can move up to 12 centimetres, which is 3 base widths. That's 3 by 4. Only one unit can actually move into a position to attack. The four element unit, which is currently in Marengo, and which can attack the two French units directly to its front. Now a quick note, um, opposing elements do not need to get into base-to-base -base combat to combat. Uh, what they basically need to do is move within the movement zone of control of an enemy, and then the combat occurs. It's assumed that the, um, the area between the two opposing forces is a seething mass of attack, counterattack, etc, etc. Now the Austrian unit of four elements, which is in the movement zone control of at least one French element, and the movement zone control is half a base width, or two centimetres. In this turn, two French units are in the combat zone control, the Austrian unit, and must be attacked. Now, once a unit gets into a movement zone of control, it then gets a combat zone of control. Combat zone of control is not necessarily a good thing. It just means that every enemy element or unit within its combat zone of control must be attacked, and all units must be attacked. Elements up to three or four, in this case I'm using four, in full front rear and base-to-base -base contact are considered to be part of a single unit. If there is a gap, it's not in the same unit and should be treated as separate units. The advantage of being in a unit is that basically that's the number of strength points which attack out the front. If you have one big unit, that's great for attack. Lots of little units, not so great for attack, but you can cover a bigger or wider frontage. The Austrians have a four element unit. 
which means its attack strength is 4. It must attack all enemy units within its combat zone of control, which is, in, which is 1 base width. Now the combat zone of control is 1 base width, not half a base width, which means it's 4 centimetres. There are 2 units, French units, with a total of 3 SPs within its combat zone of control. Thus, four attackers versus three defenders result in a one-to-one -one attack. The Austrians spin a five, which is a result of A1. Now, when you get an A1, it means the attacker uh, has to either retreat or take a casualty. The attacker either retreats one base width, or four centimetres, or takes one element loss from the rear of the unit in this case. The Austrians don't actually want to lose any elements, so they decide to retreat four centimetres. The French can advance after combat, advancing one element width or four centimetres, and that brings it back into town. However, by doing so, which it does do it, it remains in contact with the Austrian force, which means during the French game turn, it must attack the Austrians. So, yes, it's moved into the town, but unless something pretty amazing occurs, it's not going to probably stay there. It's going to probably be forced back. But you never know. It may survive, and that would be a major disadvantage to the Austrians, and so it's well worth giving it a go. Now, during the uh, French game turn, game, game turn one, the French have restricted movement. Remember, the French are surprised, and they don't really know what they're doing at the present moment until they can work out, until they actually determine the Austrians are really launching a major attack. But even with this restricted movement, they begin to form a front line. In the centre, they occupy Marengo, which is where you see the arrows, but during the combat phase must attack all enemy units in combat zone of control, as I indicated earlier. There is a four-element Austrian which needs to be attacked by the two French units, thus three versus four gives you an odds of one to two. It spins a three, which is A1, which means the French could stick around and take a casualty, but they decide against it. They decide to retreat. They have lost Marengo again. The Austrians can advance after combat and... They will also remain in contact, that is movement zone of control, of the two units which retreated. On game turn two, the Austrians continue to bring up forces. Uh, one of the biggest issues the Austrians have is funneling all their forces through one major bridge. And there is also a pontoon bridge which some stuff can also get across. Now, their funneling attempts has resulted in three four-element units in the centre right flank, which is a very powerful force. There are three combats which will now be executed as a result. The Austrians decide to first launch their attack against the French cavalry in the town. The cavalry is doubled because it's in a town, and as a result it has two strength points. The Austrians attack with four strength points, achieving a two-to-one odds. They spin a four, which is a d1. The French cavalry retreats four centimetres. The Austrians advance after combat a distance of four centimetres into the town. They remain in contact with the French cavalry. The Austrians then decide to attack at the opposite end of their attacking front. They're attacking with an element of four elements, or sorry, a unit of four elements, against two elements, which means the odds is two to one. The Austrians spin a two, which is a d1. The French could take one casualty, but they decide against it. Instead, they retreat four centimetres, in this case, across the stream. The Austrians advance after combat, four centimetres. They remain in contact with the French. Now, the issue the French have is the French must attack the Austrians, and they must attack them across the stream, which is not a good thing. Now we come to the final attack, which is in the centre. In this part of the front, the odds are four to one. At 4-1, to one, the Austrians could actually inflict casualties. Uh, they could inflict actually a casual... There's a 50-50 chance of doing so. But unfortunately, uh, they spin a result which does not result in any casualties, and the French retreats. If the French position... And this shows something interesting, the order of attack. If the French position was a line of three elements, and at each end the elements were forced to retreat, and the Austrians advanced after combat, the centre element could be eliminated because it would now be surrounded. An element is surrounded when opposing edges have enemy elements in their movement zone of control. Now, this is not going to occur here because the cavalry is too far away and there's a large gap. So there's no Austrian unit on one flank to surround the single element in the centre. 
so it doesn't occur. But if we're talking about high density combats, uh, then this is one way that you could actually eliminate the enemy. Of course, um, if the defenders uh, had a multi-element unit, instead of entirely being eliminated, they would simply decide to convert a D1 into a casualty. But regardless, whatever happens, you start getting casualties when you get a certain level of density and intensity of combat. This shows the position after all the uh, retreats and after all the advances, uh, advance of the combat. As you can see, the French have been driven back behind a stream, the Austrians have moved up, they're still technically in contact with the French, which means the French now need to attack, um, because that's simply the way the rules are, which would almost certainly result in the French continuing their withdrawal. This is possibly not the best French defence at this point, but they do come back a little bit later. This shows a bird's eye view of the front line at the end of game turn two. The French have formed a line, but it's not particularly strong. The French actually made an error in their defence and will allow the Austrians to cross the stream far too easily. The key position that they have remaining is the French in the town in the centre of the screen, roughly. You can see part of the town visible with one element in the town. It's a three strength point unit, which will be doubled to six strength point. Thus, it will be very difficult to dislodge. There is also an artillery unit in the rear that can also provide artillery bombardment support, which we'll discuss later. As suspected, uh, the French did attack and they retreated right across the line. So the result that we have is that the Austrians have crossed the stream. Now, the Austrians then launch an attack with their two full-strength units. Um, and as predicted, the attack in the centre, that is against the French element within, in the built-up area, is, is sort of a failure. Because we've got four strength points against effectively three strength points doubled, which is uh, one to two odds, and the Austrians, as a result, fail and retreat. However, the Austrian unit to the left of it, which is a higher or above the town, does succeed because it's basically a four attacking a two, a two to one, and the French retreat and it advances. Now we have a position where the Austrians actually are in almost are within the movement zone control of a flank of the town. If the Austrians can get a unit on the other side and then cause the unit in the town to retreat, then it would be very bad for the French, but that's not a particularly easy thing to achieve. Well, after one more game turn, the Austrians have managed to hold on to their position and gained another foothold across the stream. On the other side, they're attempting to outflank the town. Luckily for the French, some reinforcements have arrived, which is not shown here. The French get reinforcements on game turn two, but it's right at the other end of the playing area, and it takes a little while for it to actually get to the battlefield, so it should be coming on at the next game turn. Now the French, in order to try and secure their position around the town, decide to focus as much artillery bombardment support they can, as many elements, to try and force back that four element Austrian unit. Now within the game, artillery can actually attack or lend its strength points to any combat within 10 centimeters of the artillery. Now it could also be part of the unit and basically add its strength points as you know any other normal unit, but its big advantage is its ability to project firepower up to 10 centimetres in all direction to support another attack. And that's what has occurred here. Now the French managed to throw everything they can and they managed to cause the Austrians back in this particular point. So the outflanking manoeuvre, which we saw earlier, was forced back. So the town is once again significantly more secure. But as you can see above the unit that was forced back, another four element units coming along. The pressure is beginning to mount against the French. Soon the French will simply lack the ability to force back any of the Austrian attacks. What we've not shown here is the activity on the far French flank. Now this is a much more thinly held area and the Austrians are attacking it with smaller numbers of forces but nonetheless they outnumber the French and they've been pushing the French back. The French have been pushed back to this town here and this is about the last major defence that they have until they get to the hill. 
Now, the town will be difficult to dislodge, but you can already see there the Austrians have a three-element unit, which will quite easily push the part of the single-element unit you see at the bottom back. Now, the hill behind it is another defensive position. Uh, within the rules, if you're being attacked purely up a hill, you can be doubled in the same way you can if you're being attacked across the stream. So this uh, is probably going to be the French last line of defence on this particular frank, frank, uh, sorry, flank. And it's actually the collapse of this flank that's probably the main reason why the French will attempt to withdraw if they can. Game turn 5 has ended and the French are just still hanging on. On game turn 6 they receive 5 infantry units but it'll take a few game turns to arrive at the front line. They get another lump of units on game turn 9 and from game turn 9 onwards they can get their counter-attack bonus which is what they're really waiting for. They just need to hang on for another 4 game turns. Now the uh, die roll gods have not been kind to the Austrians as their primary objective should have been to cause casualties and shift the French far further than they have at the present moment. Uh, the casualties certainly have not occurred and they certainly haven't shifted the French as far as they should. I suspect I'm not playing the Austrians as well as I should, as I would have expected to have cleared the town and uh, should be fighting on the ridge behind this position by now, as well as having inflicted some casualties on the French, which is not a good position for me to be. This is actually one of the issues with the scenario. If the uh, Austrians don't sufficiently cause casualties, what, they're, what they normally do, unless the victory conditions force them otherwise, is withdraw to the best defensive line they possibly can so they can weather the special French counterattack. The French counterattack is basically all the French attacks are doubled from, uh, I think, for four game turns at any time from game turn nine to the end of the game. It's all got to be consecutive. So this is actually a fairly powerful French counter-attack capability. Now, of course, the French are not doubled in defence, so as long as the Austrians keep their line fairly solid and they've got a lot of forces, yeah, the French will always be able to force them back, but the Austrians should be able to, you know, hang on in their defensive position by forcing the French forces back again. Now, this is actually a problem with the scenario, and personally, I think um, a problem that could have been solved with good victory conditions construction and actually I used to play this quite a bit in board games competitions and we had to really modify the victory conditions to give you a good game uh, and also you could also put in instead of having the special French counterattack bonus if you added some command control rules where good levels of command gave you some benefit combat or otherwise you probably would avoid this rather odd situation. But this is, again, one of the things about board games. Board games are all about, you know, recreating a historical battle and making it as simple as possible. And if something doesn't work, then they start throwing in a few special rules. You're better off having a very robust and detailed and complete base system that can pretty much cover every historical occurrence and then do your settings accordingly. Anyway, that's my thought, and it's certainly something um, I probably would consider if I decide to create optional rules for these rules. I'm not going to continue to the end of the game. Um, basically, what I did now is I went, to, as the Austrian player, went into a good defensive position. The French got their bonus. They attacked, forcing me back. But because I was in a good and non-exposed position, uh, they didn't basically cause any collapses or anything. Anyway, and, and that's... That's the way the game normally ends if the Austrians don't do particularly well at the beginning. Now, there are some lessons that, or some issues when converting a board game to a fig figure gaming format. One of the issues which would strike a figure gamer is that there's no real troop type differences. While in a figure game we would have, you know, veteran, elite troops, probably uh, raw, You'd certainly have Grenadiers, which historically the Austrians did do did have here, and the Grenadiers were used to clear Marengo. But in the board game, each 1,000 men is worth the same value, irrespective of what troop types they are. It works on the whole, but it does actually you know, lack a certain flavour, which figure gamers would be more expecting than board gamers. The other area of flavour that's a bit of lacking is, you know, cavalry. There, there isn't much cavalry flavour. While cavalry basically move faster than infantry, there's no other real differences. 
Cavalry should possibly have the option of doing a double retreat if they're retreating from combat or maybe add some additional flavour. So if they're actually moving into contact for the first time, give them some benefit or something of that nature. Again, something that you could possibly add as optional rules to give your cavalry that little bit of je ne sais quoi flavour. This particular board game has got a tendency for a front line to form from playing edge to playing edge. The same occurred with this particular game. I'm uncertain if this is actually a problem or not. Uh, maybe it's actually the way things actually occur. Um, but nonetheless, I suspect that uh, you should consider doing some command control aspect. Let's say have a commander and for troops to operate normally, they need to be a certain distance away from the commander. That way you don't have a situation where you know individual cavalry units are screaming around in the rear of the enemy in an in a attempt to, let's say, surround something or whatever, which does or can occur in the board game a little bit. You know, the other issue is casualties. Well, while there is a greater chance of casualties in my modified CRT, the casualties that I experienced in this game were very low. Uh, this is not a board game versus foot figure gaming issue. It's just the way this particular game system works. A lot of this has to do with the die rolls. So at 4 to 1, you have a 50% 50, 50 chance of inflicting some casualties. It's just I only conducted two 4 to 1 attacks at this odds, and both of them resulted in D1. So... Maybe it just happened to be the way this game flowed. I suspect in some of the larger games, such as Vergam or uh, Leipzig, um, where there are more units and there's substantially more conflict, then possibly there may be more casualties. Now, the reason why this is important is uh, one of the issues about um, actually figure gaming or board gaming is how do you end the game? The later versions of SPI games, they started tracking casualties by cores or units and then later by the entire army. And then when you achieved a certain amount of casualties, then your army became demoralised, which basically meant it was time to start withdrawing. That is lacking from the Marengo game, but I think that basic concept is fairly important. Basically, in the Napoleonic period, two armies bashed away at each other until one actually, through casualties, lost so many men that they basically decided to withdraw. If you have a casualty-less game system, this becomes a little bit more difficult to achieve. Anyway, perhaps um, there's some additional modification to the CRT I should consider in future. I've mentioned this a few times already. Um, one of the biggest issues is creating the historical playing area. This takes an awful lot of effort indeed. Now we've covered the issues, what about some of the advantages? And I must admit there were significant advantages. This game of Marengo took three hours to complete. And Marengo is actually a long board game with 14 game turns. In Marengo, each game turn represents one hour instead of the more standard two, so you actually get more game turns. The game system is incredibly simple with very few special rules and special conditions. So once you know the rules, you never need to refer to the rules once again. You only need to basically refer to the CRT, and there's only one CRT you refer to. There are some complexities in this conversion around zones controls and advancing after combat, but it's not really a major issue once you get your head around the idea of basically movement zones of control, combat zones of control, and what happens when you advance after combat and you're you know, basically almost in base-to-base -base contact. And also, how do you define something being surrounded? All these things are fairly clearly defined in the uh, conversion set of rules that I've created. It's just a case of getting your head around it for the first time if you're a board gamer. And I played this against another board gamer, someone who's familiar with Moringa, but not so much with figure gaming. In conclusion, the experiment worked very well, and I'll certainly continue down this path. But I need to create a more universal terrain system which works with these rules in an ad hoc style of game. Or I need to work out how to create a historical playing area with terrain building blocks. I may create one more custom playing area, but that's pretty much my limit. I'm thinking of getting some latex rivers or water features. If that satisfies my water feature issue, and then I can place some figures to represent bridges, that could actually solve my entire problem. So we come to a close of my part one of my Napoleon at War rules. I'll most likely rewrite the rules from scratch as the existing rules were written a long time ago and for a board game and it does show 
Converting the rules into a figure gaming format would probably be a good idea if I wanted to attract other figure gamers, but one thing I really like about the rules is how short they are. Ignoring the scenarios and charts and tables, they are eight pages in length. It's true, it's a small font and three columns, but it's only eight pages, and that makes a major difference when referencing rules. I suspect I may do the same thing actually with the modern battles quads as well as this idea which incidentally was not an idea that I was ever thinking of because I tried this back in the 90s and it failed, but I tried to use hexes. Someone suggested, uh, and actually someone that was involved in the Lost Battle Ancient series of games, that uh, you could probably convert the... Well, actually, they were talking about a set of SPI Ancient games into a figure gaming format. And I thought, well, if you could do a set of Ancient games, which SPI came out with, Certainly Napoleonics would work as well, and that's where I am at the present moment. Great idea. It could give me what I've always been looking for. Nice, simple games which can be completed with a clear winner and loser, and which don't cause me enormous mental strain playing and enormous effort playing. Denken Sie daran. Immer für Hill, Hamaklin, Zukampfen.